Look deep, deep into my eyes. You are witnessing a demonstration of the awesome power of the human mind. The unlimited potential of total concentration. My mind is totally focused, able to maintain absolute and utter control. A mind such as this is a powerful force. It could even rule the world. Hey! Huh? Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. You're listening to PT Pop on a Mind Revolution, leading you out of the rabbit hole, one grain of truth at a time. Rabbit hole. Hey there, everybody. It is P.T. Pop with all four lobes of my brain securely bound behind my back. And welcome to P.T. Pop, a mind revolution. Thank you for downloading me. I hope uh, I went down slow and easy. <laughs> Man, today is January 19th, 2022. And I am shrouded in the darkness of my studio. Buried in deep in the bowels of my home. Glad you're listening. Glad you're here. Glad for each and every one of you. Thanks to every one of you to, who listens to my podcast. I started watching the TV show Only Murders in the Building with Martin Short and Steve Martin. And it's these old older fellas that are kind of beyond their prime they're kind of beyond their days in showbiz and they started a podcast about murders in their apartment building and it's pretty funny because it reminds me of, of myself running around trying to come up with ideas trying to become successful with it so i don't know man it's it's been snowing here in cleveland we got about a foot of snow in our yard other places around northeast ohio got two two and a half feet of snow and uh, I grew up in the snow. I love it. I just love the snow. I lived in Arizona for 10 years, and you can have it. You can have the desert and the cacti and the snotty people and the guns and the violence and the craziness of the southwest United States, and you can stick it straight where the sun is shining. You can all have You can all stay out there as far as I'm concerned. Don't come to the Midwest. We don't want you. I love it here. I couldn't think of any other place I'd rather be on the earth than to be... To be here, here in Ohio. <laughs> right, hit the wrong button there, kids. So, it's a, it's a good day, and I'm excited to make another little podcast here. I'm trying to do this once a week, and I'm working on a new a new documentary. Check out my my documentary, my first documentary, the award winning documentary for uh, it won for best documentary best feature documentary and it's called the artist of documentary it basically is a is a film that documents how hard it is to make a living as an artist i follow a variety of artists around the community of dayton ohio the thriving art community in dayton ohio there's a great art community in dayton and if you don't know about it you're missing something these people are nice and they're sincere and they're talented and the movie is uh now on I dare to say it, it's for free on YouTube. It's on YouTube. If you go to my channel, PT Pop, just search for PT Pop on YouTube and you'll find me right away. And it's one of the most recent releases I have up there. Runs an hour and 27 minutes. I did all the videography, cinematography, editing. Well, I did most of the cinematography. I did about three quarters of it. I did all the editing, sound, music. I wrote all the music for it. It's, I'm very proud of this. This is a great piece of art that I created. I love it. I'm going to toot my horn here. I really, really am grateful that uh, I came up with and had the opportunity to make it, especially during the pandemic. But I'm working on a new podcast. I'm sorry, not a podcast. I'm working on a new documentary, which is about is an autobiographical documentary about my childhood, being raised by both my parents who were both severe alcoholics, dealing with poverty, homelessness, and a variety of other topics that affect me as a kid and how the how their drinking and how their alcoholism affects me today as an adult and how I overcame it. It's really a story about forgiveness 
and hope. It's a, it's a story about some very powerful things that I overcame and how I came to forgiveness uh, towards both my parents and towards myself. And um, it's about finding hope in the most dire and darkest of situations. And the, the film's going to be called, or it is called, Drunkard's Path. And I'll probably have it finished this September. And I'm just going to release it on YouTube. I don't have the the budget or the money, and I don't have the connections in the music business to try to get a big distribution deal with Amazon or Netflix. Those people won't even look at me because I'm not a Spielberg, you know, or I'm not a Tarantino or whoever you happen to be to have to get those things. So, But as you saw on the thumbnail of this show, Buy it or buy it or get laid. <laughs> buy it, get laid, not buy it or get laid. Um, sorry, I'm moving some things around here in my my little setup. Buy it, get laid from the book Brandwashed by Martin Lindstrom. And this is chapter four of his book. And I I found the title of this this chapter to be fascinating because I knew exactly what he meant when when he titled it. I, I titled it, and I knew what he was going to go for to some degree. I didn't know exactly, but I knew I had a good idea of you know what he was what he was shooting for with that. But before I get to that, you know, I'm sitting here, and I've had this podcast now for about three years. This is my fourth season, and the seasons have kind of been chopped up. And I originally thought there were people out there that wanted to know the truth. Not really so much that. I thought if people knew, if I could get to a group of people out there who didn't know that they were being manipulated each and every single day of their lives by marketing companies, and advertising agencies and the such. And if I could educate people, if I could show them the way and say, hey, look, you're being fucked with every single day of your lives. Every uh, moment, every waking moment of your life, you're manipulated with sounds, with music, with words, with colors. I've proven it. I've done the research. I've seen. I've I've got the documentation of it. I've I have I mean, only hit the tip of the iceberg. I thought if people knew that when they walked into a grocery store that they were being manipulated from the moment they walked into the produce section to the moment they left trying to get you to buy things, I thought people would go, you know what? Wow, that's that's pretty crazy, man. I didn't know that. I, I Maybe I should start looking at things differently. Maybe this will change my life. I thought people go, Eureka! Eureka! I, I, I can know, I'm no longer controlled by the things that I I didn't know I was being controlled by. Why do they teach you to talk like this in some Panama City sailor want a hump hump bar? Sell crazy someplace else. We're all stocked up here. And I, I got the opposite. Yeah, I'm finding that most people don't, they don't want to know. <laughs> because what I discovered is that when you're asleep, and I'm not, again, I'm not talking about becoming woke, politically woke, because of a black-white division in this country, or woke politically. I'm talking about being woke, that you've been living in a dream world from the day you're born to the day you die. To the, you'll, you'll, you're living in a dream world from the day you're born to the day you die. Plain and simple. You're, you're mesmerized with fantasies and fairy tales from, the, from your birth. And then you're tantalized with cartoons and colors and then sex and sports and all these things that don't matter. They're a complete distraction from who you really are, who you're really meant to be, who any of us are. And it's all pushed by some weird agenda. Some people call it the matrix. You know, I'm not going to get that kind of deep into it, but, but it is basically some type of weird world they've set up. To, to keep us in this world, to keep us doing as they say. And I'm finding people don't, they don't really want to know. Because I tell you what, once you wake up from it, it's painful. You wake up, when I woke up and I realized it was all a lie, I went, oh shit. 
I've been chasing my tail for most of my adult life. You know, chasing after women that don't even exist, chasing after sexual lifestyles that weren't even legitimate, chasing after jobs that were just like, if you go into it blindly and you put on your blinders, you can do the corporate job. But when you start to realize that it's all bullshit, you're like, oh my God, this is terrible. And I find it's, it's very hard once you discover it. So I don't, I don't know if people want this or not. I, I thought this would be a good idea for a podcast. I do it because I enjoy it. I enjoy coming up with the ideas. And um, a few people out there listen to me. I don't have a huge audience. Not yet. If you, if you uh, like my podcast, tell people about it. I try my best to make it somewhat interesting. But we, uh, in this country and around the Western world, we're at war. We are at war, and we are getting our collective asses kicked. Now for a good, clean kill. Last missed. Over to you, Red Leader One. shooting red leader one a direct hit we are at war my friends we've been lied to tricked and deceived and no one seems to notice and if they do they don't seem to care in this latest chapter in martin lindstrom's book brandwash chapter four buy it get laid the new face of sex and the sexes in advertising me so horny me so I uh, am just fascinated with this chapter. He starts off, the chapter starts off, says, how many times a day? Guess, I mean, he's, he's asking the reader to guess this, but guess how many times a day men around the world think about sex? I think it's two times, three times, four times. He says, try 32 times a day, which adds up to 224 times a week that us guys think about sex. And I admit that's, that's the truth. I think about it a lot. I know every every guy friend I've ever had. We're obsessed with it. We're obsessed with women. We're obsessed with sex. We'll walk into the, God forbid I bring up the produce section again, you know. Uh, uh, uh. And we see a hot looking chick in the produce section, you know, looking at the rutabagas. And we're all thinking, boy, I could bend her over the rutabagas and do it right there, couldn't I? Uh, uh, we're all uh. thinking it. <laughs> We're all thinking it. Don't laugh! This ain't reality TV! And we think about it a lot in these companies that have products to sell. Use our interest in sex to manipulate us, to sell us products. Subconsciously. And they prey upon our weaknesses and our insecurities to get us to buy things. You know, men men and women react differently to sexually provocative advertising, he states here. Suggestive commercials, ads fe- featuring scantily clad models, that sort of thing, you know, is more relatable to a man. Women tend to be more easily persuaded by ads that are more romantic than sexual. Men respond to sexual innuendo, and women in bikinis especially when the ads or commercials were um, leavened with heaping dose of adolescent humor. Yeah, you you put some adolescent humor and some sex in a commercial, I'll buy it, you know. Pizza makes you fart and attract good-looking women. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if pizza makes you fart and attracts good-looking women. But the... The entire thing of this chapter here, and I'm trying to summarize it, but at the time of this writing of this book, which I think is 2011, there were 420 million websites spawned by the $4.9 billion global pornography industry. 
and they carry asthma everything from sexual enhancement products to escort services. And he states here that the child, uh, the age, the average age of a child that just happens to stumble upon pornography is 11 years old. And that's about when I found it. I actually saw pornography when I was younger. I saw pornography, oh, probably the age of seven. I found a stack of magazines under my dad's chair. And I don't know if everybody has a father, had a father, or still, father still have their chair. But my dad had this old green armchair, padded armchair with like skirting on the bottom. And you could hide things. You'd have magazines and stuff under there. And one day I was crawling on the floor, playing with my Legos, and I found some penthouse magazines. And I was quite startled when I saw some lady with her legs spread. I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know that women had, didn't have penises. I'm like, where the hell's her penis? <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea. And my parents never had to talk with me about sex and where babies came from. Although, well, I'll get to that later. But people are more likely to expend money in effort on products and activities if they're first primed with photographs of the opposite sex or stories about dating. And I think that's fascinating. Now, keep in mind, as I've said in all of my shows, these companies use psychologists and psychiatrists and all kinds of people to manipulate and read your brain and do studies of your brain and how to manipulate you and what motivates you to buy. So, so there's a giant, there's a whole giant campaign behind the scenes of these advertisements to how to manipulate you. And He's got a subsection in this chapter that says, if you spray it, they will come. And this is fascinating because um, this is about the uh, body spray antiperspirant deodorant company called Axe, A-X-E. And when I was a kid, there was a cologne called High Karate. And in this, in this commercial, there was this dorky looking guy with thick glasses who used this aftershave called High Karate. And high karate, he put it on and see if I can find it here on the uh, high karate aftershave. Wow, what's that aftershave you're wearing? You high karate aftershave is so powerful, it drives women right out of their minds. That's why we have to put instructions on self-defense in every package. High karate, the brisk splash on aftershave that smooths and soothes and cools. Hi Karate, aftershave, cologne, and gift sets. Hi Karate, be careful how you use it. <laughs> it's kind of funny because you can't see it, but in this commercial, this nerdy guy in his suit, he's, you know, this, this commercial is from like 1968, late 1960s, early 1970s. You know, he's dorky, he looks, he's got the thin tie in the suit, and his hair's, you know, kind of slicked back. He's got the thick glasses, and he looks like an architect or something. And he puts on the high karate and this girl attacks him. He's got to use karate moves to get away from her. <laughs> it's kind of funny because, I mean, what man, including myself, would fight a woman off if she was as attractive as this woman was and wanted him, you know, right there in the middle of the living room. I want you now because you're, you're aftershave. Okay, hon, I'll do you. I'll do you right over the, I'll do you right over the rutabagas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> so anyway, in, the, in this chapter, there's this Axe company. It's a line of men's personal care products that includes deodorant, body sprays, sticks, and roll on, so on and so forth. And the, the, the product is positioned is you know, it's basically Axe had this campaign and it was losing some money and it wasn't, it wasn't getting the kind of marketplace it wanted, the market share it wanted. And they hired a company. I don't know if this is a company they hired or this is a marketing company, but they hired, or it's their parent company, Unilever. Um, they did an in-depth study of 12,000 boys and men aged 15 to 50 around the world from the United States, UK to Mexico and South Africa and Turkey to see what men's insecurities were, what they really thought of, what their fantasies were, what they really thought was hot. <laughs> um, it's kind of funny here because I don't have these fantasies, um, but they found that, as it turns out, the number one fantasy among men in this study 
A boreal man is lounging in a hot tub or a spa. He's surrounded by three or four naked women. A corked bottle of champagne stands nearby with its foam bubbling over into the hot tub. And I, I don't understand this fantasy. I, I've never had a fantasy like this in my life. But, but the Axe team, this team of, that makes the deodorants realize something, that the ultimate male fantasy isn't just to be found irresistible by a sexy woman. It's to be found ir- irresistible by several sexy women at once. So they broke up this study into the different types of men that there are. You know, there's the predator, the natural talent, the marriage material guy, the always the friend guy, the, the dreaded, the dreaded friend, the insecure novice, the enthusiastic novice. And they found that the the what they found their product would be most appealing to was the insecure novice. And Axe came up with a series of 30-second TV commercials that preyed on the insecure novice. Now, the insecure novice is listed as being, you know, the poor young fellow who hasn't the slightest idea what they're doing in life with women. Along with marriage material and the natural talent, the United States boasts quite a few of these insecure novices. Uh, They outwardly resemble the predator type, which I'm not going to go into different types, but basically they, they focus their marketing campaign on the personality and um, sexuality of these these type of men. So with the, this this new campaign, um, they came up with these thirty second spots. In one thirty second spot, an army of bikini clad female Amazons, drawn by irresistible scent, storms an empty beach to surround and seduce a helpless, scrawny young male axe user. And another, a naked, soapy young man is showering when suddenly the bathroom floor cracks and he tumbles, still naked and dripping with suds, into the basement filled with scantily clad young women who proceed to bump and grind lasciviously enough to make a porn star break out in hives. (laughs) And the total response to this, this campaign was so successful, it was an instant hit. Axe became the number one male brand in the total antiperspirant deodorant category, earning Unilever, I guess that's the parent company, Unilever is the parent company to Axe, $71 million in sales in 2006. That's $50 million more than its closest rival, and $186 million excluding Walmart sales in 2007, an increase of 14% from a year earlier. Which was a le- which was leagues ahead of its nearest rival. Moreover, Axe had achieved global fame for its enveloping, pushing ads, which were variously termed funny, brilliant, offensive, or outrageously sexist. Either way, it was fee- free publicity, and it worked. Now. <sighs> What happened was that geeks and dorks everywhere bought Axe. And every every geek and dork was wearing this. It, was, they were, it says here they were buying it by the crate full. And their brand became known to be like dork scent. <laughs> it kind of ruined their, their brand. But that's not the point. The point is... As I've said continuously here on my podcast, they use and manipulate us every single day of our lives. Now, I know that those commercials sound funny, and they are. I've never had a fantasy of, I've had fantasy of Amazon women, but it's usually (laughs) one-on-one. And there's no subsets. But, But I've never had fantasies of groups of women, you know, tearing me apart on the beach Things like that. I've, I don't know where those come from. I've never had fantasies like that. But what I'm saying is they, they prey upon our desires. They use us and manipulate us. And then they come up with advertising campaigns to get us to buy things, whether it's underarm deodorant or cars or cigarettes or beer or clothing. You know, when I was a little kid, I remember if you bought kids' shoes. I don't know if even know if they make kids anymore. It said it would make you run faster and jump higher. The shoes make you run faster and jump higher. 
Well, I got a pair of kids and I couldn't run any faster. I couldn't run any higher. But I thought I could, you know. They, they fuck with you. These people fuck with you every single day of our lives. It's on the radio. It's on the internet. It's on TV. It's in the movie theaters. And I think it's fascinating because, you know, I didn't discover this stuff by chance. I was a graphic design major in college many years ago. And I had this class on color theory and how color can be used to manipulate your moods. And I've talked about it in another podcast. You know, my, some of my podcasts are gone. I was with Buzzsprout and I was paying them like 20 bucks a month to send my podcast out and distribute it to different places. Then I switched over to Anchor and Buzzsprout 86. They just threw away three quarters of my podcast. Some of them I still have recorded here at home. Some of them I've thrown out to save space and hard drives. But in other podcasts, I've talked about how color is used to manipulate you. They use color in restaurants. Big one. A lot of reds and oranges and yellows are used in red restaurants because reds, oranges, and yellows create hunger in the mind. They make you feel hungry. Um, but but you're 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 really messed with on a regular basis. And I'm I'm finding it's like almost like here's here's my theory. It's almost as if the world powers, which are now kind of controlled by these corporations, the pharmaceutical companies, the oil companies, and all these, you know, Walmarts and Amazons and YouTubes and not YouTubes, I'm sorry, not YouTubes, but um, Facebook and all this stuff have come up with ways to manipulate and to get your attention, to get your to get you to patronize them. It's almost like they have control of you, like they've done away with war. They're trying to do with do away with conventional war to control the people. They're doing away with rockets and bombs and landmines and submarines, even though we still have all that stuff, but they don't really need it to invade anyone. They don't need to do this anymore. Very interesting. Your papers, please. You don't need to have like a Nazi reign over someone to control them now. It's all done almost through hypnosis. And it's almost like people are powerless. When, when you watch people walking around driving with their cell phones in their laps, just it, their eyes are, are transfixed to the screen. It's, they're lost. They have no fight in them. Nobody has any fight in them. And, and I've noticed if you do happen to get upset about something, like I'll get upset about something in the store, people, they like look at you like, oh, what's wrong with that man over there? I went to Apple. I went into the Apple store the other day. And I wanted to talk to somebody who was an expert on a certain software that I like. And I waited 20 minutes to talk to this guy. And then the manager sent him home. Or no, the manager sent him to lunch. I'm like, what do you mean you sent him to lunch? I've been waiting for 20 minutes to speak to this guy. My voice started to get raised. And the big the big security guard, they have a security guard now in this Apple store I go to because somebody, I guess, dashed, stole some laptops and ran out the door. Saw thousands of dollars of equipment in the broad daylight in the middle of the day. And so anyway, this guard's looking at me. And I'm like, oh, I better calm down because this guy's going to come over and pound the crap out of me. And I'm thinking, that's weird. I'm not even really getting mad. I'm just like, what What did you do that for? It's all I said. And the guard shot at me a look. And I'm telling you, it's like people just are lost. And I, my, my idea behind this podcast was if I could at least kind of put a wedge into their eyelids, into their brain and go, hey, hey, wake up. Wake up over there. <laughs> There's some things going on you might want to know about. There's some things that... Um, you you might want to know about and uh, otherwise we're going to hear start hearing this you know i don't even know if they need boots marching anymore to take over this country or this world i don't know i don't know what it's going to be or what what the answer is I just wish people would wake up. Well, you can wish in one hand and crap in the other and see which gets filled first. And I'm not certain what's next, but I encourage you to buy this book. I, I encourage you to, to get this book, Brandwash, by Martin Lindstrom. And this chapter is chapter four. I've got another chapter. He talks about how people's mental and brain reaction to how they 
interpret the rings, how their brain responds to the ringtones and the vibrations of the phones, the same as the brain responds when someone walks in the room that they love. It's like people are in love with their phones. They're like, oh, I'm so in love with my phone. I don't know, man. If you know anybody out there who needs this information, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to back up my words with publications by legitimate people who work in marketing. And I mean, some people would say, but are you still going to half-ass astronaut? Maybe I am. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm a half-assed astronaut and, you know, I don't know. But I want to leave you with this. All we have is each other. This is, this is the thing, my mantra. I mean, all we have is each other. When it comes down to it, we can't rely on the government. We can't rely on the police. We can't rely on the armies to protect us. All we have is each other. You know, I mean, who really cares about us? The government doesn't care about us. The government, the governments want control and power so they can have different things for themselves. And I think we got to start leaning on each other. Got to cover, you know, have each other's backs. And I think that's really uh, something we got to focus on. So I'm PT Pop and the Mind Revolution. <laughs> Thanks for downloading me. And tune in again. I'll try to have another podcast out next Wednesday. Have a good night. And take care.